Hey y'all, producer Drew here. In today's episode, we're going to cover some heavy subject matter. Because of this, I felt it was important to have this content warning here at the beginning. There's going to be discussion about topics that may be triggering to some of you at home, including death and suicidal ideation. We've never steered away from discussing difficult topics on this show, and today will be no different. But if these are subjects that are tough for you to hear about, we totally understand you wanting to sit this one out. And if you or someone you know is struggling with trauma or self-harm, I encourage you to reach out and talk to someone about it. In the show notes, I'll add some links to services available that can provide support and resources. So with all that being said, let's start the show. You're listening to Binder. I'm Ray McManus. So I'm here with Robert LaHoop, the founder and director of Bullets and Band-Aids. Really an awesome nonprofit organization that I think uh, I'm going to let you talk a little bit about what it does and how it came to be. I'm a little familiar with it. I've run into a few folks, friends of mine, writers that have been involved with it and love it. We'll need to talk a little later um, because I really want to be involved with it. But Robert, tell us a little bit about, you know, how this came to be and what brought you to to want to do something like this. It's funny. I think there were a few different aspects of my life that brought me to this point. So I was in the Marine Corps Infantry from 2000 to 2004. I was with 3rd Battalion, 6 Marines. We were the first ones into Afghanistan, so we mm-hmm. took the Kandahar Airport. And then after that, we took the embassy in Kabul. I, in spite of who it was that I was, uh, made an Afghan friend. He didn't speak English. I didn't speak Dari. So it was one of the purest relationships I could imagine. Right. But we smiled and we laughed and we did one another favors. And over the span of a few months, it just it really had an impact on me. And then someone force fed him oil. Mm. And basically, uh, by the time I got out, I was isolated. I felt as though I was outside of society. And I don't know, I didn't feel a band of brothers thing. I just uh, uh, went mad. I drank a whole bunch. Like, Like I, well, actually for... 10 years of my life, I, I subconsciously thought that I was going to die the next day. Wow. And so that's how I lived, which is not good for a lot of different things. Right. Um, you know, it's not, not good for dentistry uh, or taxes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Uh, uh, or savings or any of that. You know, it comes along with a whole bunch of wonderful stories where I can only remember about a quarter of them. Right. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but it was because I was trying to be known just as everyone else has to be known to feel valued in a group and didn't. It got worse and worse. And then finally, I decided to write a memoir. And it was a graphic novel memoir because, of course, you know, I'm familiar with writing that style of media. And uh, uh, sorry. The initial intention of it was a suicide note. Hmm. It just was like there was like, but then I thought, okay, how am I going to? put this into a context where it's not just, you know, uh, uh, you know, a firecracker that went off and then everyone continues. What was it that I was going to leave behind? And then by the time I was done with it, I was like, well, how is it going to make an impact if it's not created? And, uh, after a while, I realized that all of these wounds that I had been airing out began to heal. And then uh, I, I went to the University of South Carolina, where I focused on writing for media. And so for most of my adult life, I've been uh, uh, hanging out with artists. Hmm. And even then, I was in this limbo between, uh, you know, I was always too much of a veteran for artists and too much of an artist for veterans. But 
you know, so long as I was around, you know, my people, which were, you know, we could still do productive things. You know, I was, I was with the Pienza Art Company with Dre and Sammy Lopez. It was the three of us. We were doing a bunch of different art shows. And at one point, I thought, you know, we're getting 150, 200 people to show up to these shows. Why not raise money for charities? And so I think the third or fourth charity that we did was veteran focused. The first bullets and band-aids happened at 701 Whaley in 2012. We were raising money for another nonprofit. At the end of it, uh, everybody, you know, the veterans were saying, oh, this is, this is wonderful. And so in 2016, I did it again. And, uh, uh, and this time we printed out a booklet with it. So it had the stories that were next to the artwork. For volume one, it was just a book, a book that, that had the stories. Volume two, it was stories and artwork. And at one point, we got news coverage where one of the people I interviewed said, I would not have been able to tell my wife this story were it not for the disconnect that Bullets and Band-Aids provides. Mm-hmm. We became a nonprofit in 2019, and uh, our highest watermark at the time was to have two people from opposite ends of the same conflict be in one show. Because if there's anything that's been underscored to me since I was a child and then echoed throughout you know, the rest of my life, including but not limited to uh, my time in Afghanistan was that we're all sharing a common human journey and uh, that there is power in knowing other people's stories and, and in telling your own. I think what impresses me about this particular program, you know, my uncle didn't talk about Vietnam. My granddad didn't talk about World War II. Guys that I graduated from high school Went into the Marines, found themselves in Mogadishu, um, you know, came back and talked about it. Hmm. Um, and uh, you'll have to bleep this out. Uh, and it f***ed them up. Um, you know, friends of mine that went to Afghanistan, friends of mine that went to Iraq, you know, they might have come back and had all their limbs, but the scars that they carried back with them were horrendous, hmm. horrifying. Most of the time came out once we were drinking, you know, and they'd get real quiet and before you know it, they just like stare off and start talking and start telling stories. And to witness that, to see that was probably the closest I could ever come to understanding anything close to what they went through. And all I could ever do is imagine. What I love about what you're doing here, and I want you to talk about that because what you do is unique with Bullets and Band-Aid. It isn't just, let's just come in and, and let's just record stories. Let's just get those stories out so people can listen to them. The process, the aspect that you're doing provides this really a multidimensional opportunity. And then you said the magic word, and I think this is so important, distance. So talk about the process of what you guys do with Bullets and Band-Aids, because it truly is unique. It's almost immersive. Well, talk I think about that's, that. that's- Kind of you to, to, to say that's a, um, yeah, it's true that there's not, like, I've, I've, I've searched, I've scoured, there's not, uh, uh, something quite like this that's been done, at least in America, which is, you know, good and bad. Uh, uh, it's bad because there's no template to go off of. There's no one I can reach out <laughs> yeah. to and be like, should we do this instead? But it's good because, you know, it's the Wild West and it's a little bit chaotic and that's lovely. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. So what we do is we find veterans and interview them. I think one of the key things being that you don't have to have been in combat to be a veteran. Right. Our veteran population is mirroring our population in general, which means we cover all of the demographics. Right. And the third is is that you don't necessarily have to be in America to be a veteran. When I when I finished my military service, I was bitching a lot about like the only thing that I got from the military was uh, um, knee problems. And now when we talk about it, and thank you for bringing this up, and thank you for having this interview, I realized that I got so much out of the military. Mm-hmm. And like to have this ability, first of all, to listen to people and to deal with different situations daily and to have this ability to adjust to changes very, very mm-hmm. fast. Because, yes, you can have a schedule for the day, but it can change multiple times and you have to be very creative. I'm not responsible all, all for myself. 
are responsible for a group of 20 people, 30 people, 40 people, it depends on the group size, that I'm their mom, dad, sister, sibling, whatever. I'm everything for them. Mm. Inside of the base, I'm everything for them. I had a commander. As I said, you know, there was a, uh, the, the Pope, actually it was an outside uh, newspaper, which I can't think of the name of it right now, but they would always come to our battery and talk to our unit because we, we always, our battery always excelled. Before they came, you know, everybody was like, okay, you got to go get dressed up, cleaned up, put on your best, and uh, we're going to meet in the day room. I had to be the first one on the scene no matter what, because I didn't want nobody to say I was late. That's how, how that was just who I was. So I got dressed, cleaned up, put on my very best little suit I had, pants and a jacket and shirt, look very professional, get in the room. I'm the only one in the day room. My commander walks in. And he said some nasty things to me, some explicit sexual things he said to me. And um, it just shook me to my core. And I was so in shock. I ran out the room and I was afraid to go back into the room, you know. And then the first sergeant comes in and all of the people start coming in. So, um, yeah, I was uh, just taken back. And then, and then I thought, Maybe I should report him to somebody, but he's the commander. So who do you talk to to tell? Whenever we were bombed on the news, it would say five scuds came in, you know, and three of them landed in the water. We didn't have any water in Saudi Arabia, you know, but they say if they landed in the lakes, we didn't have any lakes in Saudi Arabia, not in, in Riyadh. So it was amazing. Listen, it was amazing listening to the news be told and say, well, these that these guns fell into <laughs> into the lake, you know. <laughs> we knew there was a lake, and then we'd go out the next day. And we we could find the apartments that were destroyed. After we uh, uh, find veterans, we uh, we interview them, mm -hmm. and then uh, we hand that interview off to a civilian writer that then writes something based on it. They have to stay true to the subject and the context without undermining either or a group of people, and then we hand that written work to a civilian artist who then creates something based on the story. They also have access to the interview as well as the veteran, if need be. Mm -hmm. And then we take this written work as well as the art, we put it together into a book, and then we tour participating cities with both the book and the original artwork. So when they come in, and do the interview, and then you pass the interview off. Is the writing primarily prose? Is it poetry and prose? Is it see that that's that's the thing? If they stay true to the subject and the context without undermining either or a group of people, it can be an impressionist poem. Mm -hmm. It can be a recipe. Mm -hmm. It can be prose. It can be iambic pentameter. It can be whatever it is that they think is appropriate in regard to communicating through their voice, what it is that they gleaned from the interview. Between their efforts in doing that and the efforts of the artist to do the same, that is the dialogue that we can guarantee we will facilitate. Mm -hmm. But because everybody invests from all of these different places, all of these different demographics, that style of dialogue is not only healthy, but infectious. And I think that's what I love about it, is the style of dialogue. It takes what would be two-dimensional um, at best or, or one-sided conversation and just blows that up um, to a point where you're able to approach it multiple sides, multiple angles, and you're able to get, I really think, a, a, a fuller understanding and appreciation, whatever the appreciation may be. One of the things, though, that really kind of dawned on me, and granted, I don't work with veterans nearly at this capacity, but, you know, I do have several that have come back and, you know, have manuscripts of poems, you know, and they, they need help putting these things together. And what really kind of blew me away was that there's a lot of levity. There's a lot there that the civilian world can connect to and understand. And so when you hit those moments, when you hit those, those truly heavy moments, 
there's a real empathy that can begin. There's a real understanding that can happen. Um, yeah, we actually, we intentionally uh, want to separate the, the stories like sporadically so that you don't know what you're going to get. We are definitely look for humorous stories one way or another, mm-hmm. just because, you know, humans. I mean, we like one of the things that, that is an issue when it comes to being a veteran is that people want to put us in a box. Either oh, yeah. we're broken or we're a hero. Mm-hmm. And there's no gray area, right. but we are gray area like anyone else is. And mm-hmm. so we don't shy away from telling stories about, uh, uh, you know, sexual assault or racial disparities or LGBTQ issues. But we also, you know, highlight the band of brothers aspect, if, if that's the part of it. If it does have, uh, you know, a religious inclination, you know, we'll broach that subject. We're not going to claim that we have any sort of religious or political affiliation. But we want to tell the stories about the the things that move these people one right. way or another, and keeping it real. I mean, that's, oh yeah, you know that's the thing. You know, unfortunately, because of of Hollywood, because of television, um, what people think happens and how it happens is it 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 is beyond imaginative. I mean, it's a construct. You know, this is real. This person is real. This voice is real. This really happened. This is a real understanding by one artist. And here's another real understanding by another artist that truly is an awesome experience that you were creating. And I know that there's probably folks that might be listening that like, you know, hey, how can I support bullets and band-aids? If, if, you know, I'm not a writer, I'm not an artist, I'm not a veteran, but I think that what you're doing is amazing. Is there an opportunity that people can support or help this organization so that it can continue to grow and flourish. Oh, absolutely. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, we have been supported by a great number of people. And and for that, we are grateful, spreading the word, their positivity. Uh, that's, that's entirely wonderful. But if they could just get on to bulletsandbandaids.org and hit the donate button, I think that would go a very long way. Because we're volunteer run, all of our expenses are things like renting the U-Haul truck or getting packaging material or the gas that it takes, the, uh, uh, you know, paying the writer or paying the artist. We do this in order to make sure that everyone's putting their best foot forward. Mm -hmm. Because all of these veterans that are telling their stories need to be treated with the utmost dignity. Mm -hmm. And I think that is our chief goal one way or another. Robert LaHoop is the founder of Bullets and Band-Aids, a non-profit organization that matches veterans with writers and artists to tell their stories through original, collaborative artwork presented in a touring art and storytelling experience. Their exhibition, Bullets and Band-Aids, a veteran anthology, is on view at the Columbia Museum of Art through September 3rd. Robert will be back in just a moment, and he's brought some friends along. It's not as heavy when I'm creating my own stuff. The, I think the approach is the same, but there are differences with just how much weight there will be when it's somebody else's life. We'll be right back. Hey, y'all. Producer Drew here. On March 31st, Columbia's favorite creative party returns. Arts and Drafts is back with live performances from punk band The Planks, tongue-twisting revolutionary rhymes from Link Franca, psychedelic synth pop from Nashville's Jive Talk, and CMA favorite DJ Lady Marauder will be here spinning jam after jam after jam. Get your creative juices flowing with unique art projects led by USC Screen Printing and Baraka Crafts. Learn a little something with the Columbia World Affairs Council and Femex Columbia. Line your stomach with tasty bites from Falafel King, Los Chicanos, and Parabellum Mobile Eats. And if you dig this podcast, come be a guest. We'll be set up doing recordings throughout the night to get your takes on art, the museum, and of course, arts and drafts. Oh, and did I mention there's going to be art on view? Of course there is. We're a museum. So come on down and party with us at Arts and Drafts, March 31st at the Columbia Museum of Art. See you there. As a child in Afghanistan, Zia witnessed the brutality of the Taliban and strict Islamic rule in his own neighborhood. His sisters were not allowed to attend school. 
His older brother was beaten and imprisoned. My father decided we had to leave. We went to Pakistan. When I was in sixth grade in Pakistan, I decided to learn English so that I could talk about what the Taliban was doing in Afghanistan, what I had seen. And I said, if I grow up, because we were not sure we would still be alive, one day I will fight against these people, these butchers. In 2001, when the United States came to Afghanistan, we moved back in Kabul. I start to teach other children the language. We were the eye and the tongue of the military. Zia signed up as an interpreter in 2002. He was 18 years old. Interpreters were more than simply translators. They were fixers, diplomats, guides, able to translate terrain and customs and people as much as languages. They sent me to the border of Pakistan. I was there for six months. For six months, I couldn't even see my family, anything. There was no communication. I didn't know I had a dollar. After a few months, my captain brought a letter to me. It was from my wife. He said, you have to go. I said, no, now it was too late. I was supposed to be there at the moment, but now I have to be with you guys. I'm Ed Madden, and it was my honor to be the writer of this story. My name is Dre Lopez, and I had the honor and privilege of creating a painting about the story. This is Zia Gafuri, founder of Interpreting Freedom Foundation and a former U.S. Army Special Forces interpreter. Well, let me start by saying that uh, every group that I've had has been an honor to work with. I think this one stands out, given the people that are involved. It's a pleasure to have each of you here. Thank you so much for this. I think uh, uh, the opportunity that we have to showcase Zia's story is the sort of value and substance that uh, a lot of us don't know about. And with everyone's efforts involved, I think we've created something incredible. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you guys have done. Yeah. I guess we'll start with Zia. Like, how did you feel when we reached out to you? I was very excited and especially I was excited to hear that you guys came up with this beautiful foundation and idea to spread uh, the voice, the experience of the life of every human, especially our veterans across the country. I think one of the things that we need to continue underscoring because of the staggering amount of sacrifice that you have put forth this is, in fact, your country. You were brought here, your family is here now, and the amount of sacrifice that you have put forth overshadows your casual civilian that lives in America. Sincerely. Thank you, appreciate it. I'm very happy that I could able to save my children, that at least I could able to help others that they should not face with the same problems and challenges that I used to face. Absolutely, yeah. I, th I think uh, uh, the way we left Afghanistan is tragic on a bunch of different levels. And uh, the idea that it would be handed over <laughs> along with so many weapons is unspeakable. The idea that we would have to make the efforts individually, that you would have to make the efforts individually in order to mend these issues is a uh, terrible black eye on our country, to be entirely honest, in my, in my opinion. I think it undermines the sacrifices of everyone involved. By my personal opinion, I think it was uh, a disaster. And I think, it, you know, thank God that you're doing what you do. Thank you. As you know that I founded Interpreting Freedom Foundation in 2000. 18, the reason I found this foundation, because those challenges and those issues that my family and a few of my friends' family faced, so we came up with the plan to help our allies who fought in the front line, who took a bullet for both nations. And today they are coming to uh, United States 
at least we could able to help them, assess them the right way and path and teach them the culture, like law and rule in the United States. Because most of our allies spend their life with our men and women in uniform, but their children, they're not familiar with those cultures. So it's very important for every single families who are resettling here in the United States, that we are making sure that they could have a place to live, have a driver license, that they could have a transportation to take their children uh, at school in daily basis. But unfortunately, as you guys know, last year, on August last year, what happened in Afghanistan was chaos. Everybody was running tours to Echkia airport uh, to save their lives. And every single day and night, we were receiving phone call that our allies are hiding from those butchers. Well, hopefully uh, uh, us showcasing your, your story uh, will get the word out. Again, that's uh, the Interpreting Freedom Foundation. That's an extraordinary cause. I think that's a, that's a great segue in regard to Ed. Ed. Uh, what did, what would you have? Like, what did you think when we reached out to you? Well, I had never participated before, so this was a new project for me. And you promised me a good story, a rich story, and I, I got that. I mean, I will say when I listened to the interview, I was both moved by the story, but I was already tr trying to think how I would write it, and I just thought there's so much here, uh, there's so much to tell. And you may remember, Robert, you didn't give me a word count. And so the first version I gave him was like twice as long as it was supposed to be. Um, and he was, he wrote me back. He said, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I slashed it down. But I, the two things I thought of, one is I thought I'm going to focus on major moments. So the decision to become an interpreter and the fact that it happens right at the moment, you're finding out that your wife is pregnant with your first child, the battle at Shock Valley, and then the... Uh, escape to the United States and you're going back to get your family. Yes, the Shock Valley mission was the worst firefight uh, we have been faced in yeah. the since 12, uh, 14 years. And we were surrounded by 200 people and you we were receiving fire from all around us. And I lost my best friend there, CK, not even a foot far from me. So I told him to get cover. But unfortunately, there was not like a good place to cover yourself because they knew it, that we are coming and they already had a kill zone uh, set up for us. So we lost CK and we had a serious uh, six, seven member of our teammates were serious wounded because we were two, three people there alive and were fighting back in that area. Then I saw, I called my other colleague, uh, Behros Momon. So I told him like, we need to get everybody out of the kills. So we start carrying everybody and brought them from the mountain to the HLC. Like that was 10,000 feet and climb back, get the other wounded. So we'll keep going. We had a, a wounded on our shoulder and in the other hand, we had our gun and fighting and take the wounded to the safety and medifag them. So that was like a very crazy mission. Mm -hmm. Unforgettable. The other thing I really wanted to do because you're a translator is I wanted to emphasize the importance of language and moving back and forth across languages. So I included moments, Robert, with the interviewer talking to Zia. I incorporated elements from newspaper stories and I read a book about the Battle of Shock Valley. So I tried to incorporate pieces of that. And even Zia, when you would talk on, it was great to have a video and not an audio because I would see you doing gestures when you told a story. So I incorporated descriptions of the gestures because I thought that's part of how language works too. So I just want to be very conscious of the ways that you are someone who moves across languages. So I wanted the essay itself to suggest moving back and forth across different kinds of languages. And I also want to emphasize the power of language. I mean, the call to drop the bombs in Shock Valley, that call, the power of that. The moment Donald Trump outs you on television, which puts your entire family at risk, I just wanted to get the power of words into the piece as well. Yeah, the, the, the cadence, the way that it did uh, weave between 
different voices, I guess, reinforces the relationship, the organic nature of all of this. The pacing, the tone, it was, it was impeccable. Well, thank, um, you. <laughs> thank you, man. That's one of the cool things about this uh, uh, is that none of this could happen without every person being involved. So the end result is that everybody is grateful to everyone else justifiably and vocally. I think that's really cool. Dre, I guess you've done this since day one. The Pienza Art Company are the ones that put on the first one in 2012. We did. Seven years before we became our own nonprofit. So, and you've participated in everyone since. Yeah. So, uh, uh, what did you think about this one? So, you know, having been there from day one, you know, and I've always, it'll always be easy for me to repeat this anytime that I have the conversation, whether we're at the shows or somebody that has also done it before or a brand new person, you know, I, I've always felt a lot of pride taking part in this specific showing this specific concept, this specific idea because of the power that it has both between telling stories about people whose stories either are not told or people who also have a difficulty letting any of the stories out. That to me has always been extremely powerful, both for the veteran and also for the civilian that's coming in to read the story, to kind of marinate on whatever the visuals are. And that spirit, that concept for what you wanted to do with Bullets and Bandies, you know, from the be very beginning of it all the way down to this growth of, of, of a nonprofit. There's not one moment throughout the many years of, that I've been able to be a part of this that I haven't felt the same pride and inspiration to do any part of it, you know, whether it's been creating pieces, helping set up the shows, the conversations that, that you and I have, it's always been easy for me to just dive into it because I, I want to be able to work on stuff that I feel proud of. I want to be able to work on stuff that has some level of importance. You know, I think as a visual artist, I have to convey something, you know, that's going to be part of whatever legacy I end up having convey something, create a reaction over something. And what better thing to create a reaction over than these types of stories? What did you feel and how did you approach creating the work? So I didn't, I didn't watch the, the interview ahead of time. I went ahead and, you know, between timing and then later on choice, I wanted to also include Ed's point of view within what the story is, you know, because I feel like it's most important to do justice to Zia's journey, but because I'm collaborating with another esteemed creator, I wanted to make sure that, that his words and, and work within it somehow could be visualized. So it added different layers, but at the same time, because he kind of went through a bunch of the growing pains of it and made it a little bit more succinct and gave it a voice that actually had a consistent flow through it. It was a great pace and it also was very informative in a way that to me visually completed a lot of the, the bits and pieces of it. So I think after, you know, reading it several times and working on some sketches, I decided that I was just going to try to cram everything in as, as best as I could, you know? So I, I put a lot of thought into symbolisms throughout the whole painting because I did not want to leave anything out, you know, like the journey was just from the beginning of it, you know, the, the dedication to saving his family, saving his country, choosing to, to, to become an interpreter all the way through finally being able to get out and then come into disappointments within how a lot of stuff was handled by the government. It was just so many things that, that I felt were important to me as I read it. And obviously, if, if I felt that, then this is, this is a, a real man's life story. So. It was a lot to take in. It was a lot to try to put down. But, you know, I hope that it did you justice, man. Thank you. Thank you, brother. You did a great job. I really appreciate it. Thank you, brother. It was an honor. I, I, I just, I love the, that phrase you used, the idea of doing justice to the story, because I think that's part of, I almost want to say, the weight you feel when you take this project on, the responsibility you feel is that you want to do justice to everything about that story. I have never written another folks' voices before. Um, so this was something absolutely new for me. 
I do write prose and I do write essays and I've lately been writing essays that are kind of braided essays, like moving back and forth among related topics. But I think that's why that felt so right for this story, because it let me stay absolutely accurate to your voice. So there, there are moments in this essay that are absolutely just transcripts of what you said. But it also let me work in so many other voices. And then there, there's my voice in there. Mine's the voice in some ways controlling the whole thing. I know that. And my voice are the, the kind of set pieces where I say, this is where this is happening. This is where this is happening. This is what the, this means. But I guess I wanted the language to do some of the things that happened to me when I was listening to the interview. There are these moments in that interview where I was just like, oh, my God. So your fellow soldier, Zia, gave you an informal Purple Heart because of the sacrifices you had made. But then you couldn't get a Purple Heart here. And then there's that moment you say, I couldn't get it and I can't get the medical benefits because I wasn't wearing the uniform. But then I'm reading in the Battle of Shock Valley, the book about it, that the reason you guys were targeted was because you were wearing the American uniform. So all these moments that I wanted there to be those juxtapositions and those surprises and those little senses of injustice when I see those things juxtaposed together in the text. And for me, the kind of the way I wrote it as a prose piece helps to amplify those moments as well as amplify the voice itself. Well, I think fundamentally what we're what we're trying to do is is facilitate dialogue, not just for the attendees, not just for the people that are going to be reading the book and, you know, turn to their left and right and begin it. But uh, that investment that the writer and the artist put forth we don't just guarantee that a veteran has an opportunity to tell their story. We can guarantee that that story is heard. We show evidence of it. And I think uh, that, that fundamentally, that style of communication is invaluable. By the way, uh, uh, to your credit, again, Ed, when I interview people, like I'm not an interviewer typically, <laughs> so I will ask questions from, you know, things that we were discussing 30 minutes beforehand or something like that. It's like the idea that you would put this junctive piece together into a linear fashion is also applaudable. <laughs> like I, I realized that, you know. Uh, yeah, speaking of not being able to do interviews, <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't know exactly where we should go from here. Um, I guess, do you want to uh, discuss what it is that your uh, foundation is going to be doing in the, in the coming months or years? Uh, yes. Uh, so right now we are working with all the Afghans who resettled in the United States. So we are helping them find them a place to live. We're trying to assist them to get them to the appointments that their children and their family has. And also in the next two, three months, we are working to get their green cards. So that's very important that they should have the legal documents. Uh, otherwise they will lose their job. They will not have a driver license. So they will face with all those difficulties and that they have, they just got here on you know, the first day. So we're trying to, uh, coming up with a plan to put a pressure on our lawmaker that we could pass the bill uh, to get their the green card for all our allies who evacuated uh, last year. How, uh, how many people have you helped so far? Just in Charlotte that I live uh, in my community, 75 uh, families, which is more than uh, 400 people. And so it's countless, like mm -hmm. all over the places, in Virginia, like DC, California, like most of them in California, and Sacramento, mm -hmm. and Texas, and Chicago. Uh, so we work all around. Yeah, you know, you'd help. You'd help facilitate a massive amount of of people. Uh, was it like fourteen hundred? I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, fourteen hundred all at once. At one point, with an endowment that was given to you, like that's one of the things that's evidence of your uh, you know quality of mission and uh, your own investment in it is that you were given this significant endowment and then immediately gave it to another group in order to get 1,400 humans out of this horrible circumstance, you know? Like, uh, uh, yeah, you know, as I said, I can't say it enough. You not simply honor 
you know, myself and, and these gentlemen and bullets and band-aids, I think what you're doing is honoring those people that might potentially hear it in the future. Absolutely. Yeah. I really appreciate from a bullet and bandage and especially from you and Drew Matt that they put all their effort that uh, came up with this story uh, that I have been uh, told to you guys. So yes, we give those sacrifices for both nations and the team that we were working, we have like a brotherhood. We always have that brotherhood. So we didn't give our sacrifice for something that's not worth it, but it's worth it for our brothers in arm who were in the battlefield uh, fighting shoulder to shoulder to achieve the goal that we have. You just heard Robert speak with Ed Madden, Dre Lopez, and Zia Gafuri, a writer, an artist, and a veteran who each participated in the Bullets and Band-Aids project. You know, when you think about art's potential, I mean, just, just that in and of itself, it's, it's awesome and amazing because art can do so many different things for not just the artist and writer, but for those who witness it, those who are observing it. But when you think specifically about art's therapeutic potential, you know, I've, I've worked with young writers and, and old writers um, doing various workshops where, you know, they write through and write about traumatic experiences. And one of the things that always comes out of that, because it's deep, it, it hurts to write through it. You know, one of our mottos when we're doing those kinds of workshops is, you know, you have to write through the pain, you have to write through the pain, you have to write through the pain. When they share that experience, though, for the audience to hear it, for the audience to feel it is truly an emotional experience. But for the writer, for the artist, it's cathartic. For the writer and for the artist, it, it becomes a way of letting go, of taking something that you've kept inside of you for so long. And I know that that can sound somewhat hokey, but it truly is the essence of a therapeutic project. To let that moment go is fantastic for the individual, but for that to be picked up by the audience truly becomes a community experience. It's not just letting go of the weight, it's sharing the weight. You've been listening to Binder, a production of the Columbia Museum of Art. Today's episode was hosted by me, Ray McManus, produced and edited by Drew Barron, with special assistance from Joel Ryan Cook. For more information about CMA exhibitions and programs, visit our website at www.columbiamuseum.org.